It's not about happiness. I mean, part of this is about learning to cultivate the circumstances in your life that will promote more frequent positive emotions. You know, one of the things you said, which I love, is concerted pursuit of a meaningful goal. I agree, and, and but here's the problem that I see with a lot of men. A lot of my clients will do that, and then we accomplish a small or huge goal, and we're so ill-trained that we can't even stop to savor and enjoy the accomplishment of that goal. We're just immediately on to the next thing. What's next? What's next? What's next? And that's a really lousy way to live life. What is going on, everybody, guys? Welcome back this week to another amazing, very, very exciting and impactful and insightful episode of The Superman Life. As always, guys, I'm your host, Frank Rich. And before we get into introducing today's guest, let me just remind you how incredibly grateful and thankful we are to have you here with us today. Happiness, anger, success, positive emotions, negative emotions, masculinity, are these topics, are these buzzwords, are these things that are maybe controlling some of the things controlling your life, some of them you're trying to pursue and you're not actually achieving and reaching your final destination, you're not final reaching your goals. Guys, we have an incredible guest and we're going to discuss the importance of understanding our emotions, understanding self-awareness, the role that negative emotions such as anger, depression, rage play in our life, why it's important for us to pursue positive emotions and what role does that play in us living a meaningful and successful life we have one of the the world's leading experts on positive emotions happiness man uh man box culture and masculinity with us on the show today is none other than dr john shinnerer dr john shinnerer coaches men to greater success and happiness at work and at home Dr. Gron graduated from uc berkeley with a phd in psychology he was an expert consultant for pixar's inside out now, his areas of expertise include high performance, stress management, man box culture, which we do dive into, positive psychology, anger management, and creating thriving relationships. Now, Dr. John hosts the Evolved Caveman podcast, which helps men find success and happiness. There have been over 16,000 people that have taken his online anger management course. And you can visit the evolvedcaveman.com to learn more about the podcast. Now, Dr. John recently received awards for best executive coach in leadership and healthcare. He recently recorded micro courses on anger management and forgiveness for a simple habit, and they've been listened nearly 125,000 times in just the first year. And in this episode, John and I discuss why anger is such a controlling emotion for so many men, why we suppress so much of our feminine side of our nature and how that leads us into these destructive patterns and destructive cycles of what some would maybe say toxic masculinity. We we'll really touch on that here in the show. Now we also get into understanding happiness. What is happiness and why is it okay to have happiness as a worthy goal? And is it okay to have happiness as a worthy goal? And then we get into the man box culture. And this is John's, you know, latest work that he's really diving deep into unpacking men's traumas, unpacking men's issues from the way that we've all been uh, raised up and brought up in today's society and today's culture. Uh, incredible conversation. And guys, let me remind you, if you're getting value out of these episodes, you can continue to support us in one of two ways. First off, pause this right now, go leave us a five-star rating and written review, whether it's on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, it doesn't matter. We're on all the platform guys. So wherever you are listening, if you're getting value, we appreciate those reviews. But most importantly, if after listening to today's conversation, something resonated with you and there's somebody in your life that needs to hear this message, please do us the favor, but then the blessing of sharing today's conversation. Without further ado, guys, let's get into today's conversation with none other than Dr. John Schinnerer, unpacking self-awareness, masculinity, man box culture, and anger management. We'll see you on the other side. Dr. John, welcome to the Superman Life. Frank, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, brother. I'm doing great, man. I'm excited. Uh, been looking forward to this since uh, you and I connected on on your show. So I think we're going to be able to really dive into some topics that we've touched uh, a handful of times, but I think you bring a unique perspective. And I'm really excited to kind of dive into your work, your experience, your expertise, and at the end of the day, serve the men out there that are that are part of our audience. So um, let's, let's jump in, man. I think, you know, where I wanted to start with you is, is kind of at the early points in your career, 
Um, you know, you've done a lot in the psychology field. You've, you're doing a lot of great, great men's work here today. What did your time as a school psychologist teach you about humans, emotions, but more importantly yourself and how's that impacted the work that you're doing today? Uh, great question. I, so yeah, I was trained at UC Berkeley to be a school psychologist. And I remember I was, you know, probably 25, 26 and I was a school psych in a high school setting in Fremont in kind of a rough area of town. And the best part of my job was listening to the students coming in, counseling them. And what I realized is that their stories were filled with anger, fear, sadness, guilt, shame, and, and appropriately so. They were dealing with some really heavy stuff. Um, you know, alcoholic parents, abusive parents, worried about getting jumped on the way home from school, teen pregnancy, drugs and alcohol, all that stuff. And what I didn't know at the time when I was 25, 26 is that emotions are contagious and just how emo how contagious they can be. In other words, we can catch emotions from other people due to our sense of empathy. And there, there's actually research from heart math that shows that the heart creates an electromagnetic field that emanates about six feet outside of the physical body, which could be part of the explanation for that along with mirror neurons, but that's a tangent. So anyway, for those of us out there that are listening that have a strong sense of empathy, be aware that you're picking up other people's emotions all the time. If you're not trained to protect yourself from your own empathy, which is kind of an interesting statement, but that's what I was doing. I was picking up these negative emotions and they were weighing me down. I had no awareness of them and it ended up with me getting depressed. And when we get depressed, inflammation in our body goes up typically. And so any of the old injuries that you have tend to come back. And for me, that was low back. So I remember I got depressed, my back went out, I'm in pain, hope kind of jumped out the window. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Like, how can I teach them to manage their emotions if I can't manage my own? And so that was kind of the first step of making a conscious decision to look for scientifically proven tools to manage that darker side of the mind and the heart. Mm, that's powerful, man. I, I, I love the way that you, you phrase that. And I think everybody has sensed this at a certain point in their life, right? Like you walk into a room or you have, maybe it's a family member, you have somebody that's like a part of your life, but you don't really look at them as a close friend. When you're around them, it just, the, 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 the energy within the room, it just feels a little bit different. But what you're saying is there's actually been some, some, some research showing like we are picking up from this energetic field. Can you, can you maybe dive a little bit uh, deep, deeper there? Well, I can, I can give you an example. Like recently I took my mom who's 85 to the emergency room and she is a terrible patient. And she will tell you this, that she is a terrible patient, but she, she was kind of panicked at times and she, her pain threshold was much lower than it used to be. And it was really hard for me because I think it's easier to pick up emotions of those who are close to you than those who you don't really care much about. But I was picking up her anxiety, her fear, her panic, and I had to coach myself through it. Like, John, this isn't your stuff, not your emotion. Take a deep breath, relax. This isn't your fear. And, and so I had to remind myself that this is not my fear that I was picking up, that it's separate from me, it's outside of me, which allows me to stay calm in the moment and therefore think more clearly and help her out and support her better. Yeah, I love that. Um, I mean, with you obviously being, you know, a trained professional and expert and having the experience that you do, like this is at the front of, of your awareness. But, you know, thinking, you know, audience now, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing like there's actually some, you know, there's real value here that maybe we can, you know, pass through this, this, this conversation. If somebody's hearing this and like, damn, that makes sense. Like I, you know, maybe, maybe they got names kind of popping up in, in their head, you know, John down the street or, you know, so-and-so from, you know, the local, you know, the local grocery store, maybe the guy at church, or maybe it's the, the person sitting in the cubicle next to you. Once you've identified if there's an individual in your life, maybe you, maybe you're not in a position to remove yourself from that relationship. What are some, you know, strategies, tactics, real-time things that people can do? Cause I, it, I, I think I'm hearing it's, you said you got to understand your emotions first. So, yeah, is there a, a, a process or, or, or tips yeah, and so tactics it here? It starts with, it, pardon me for interrupting, it starts with self-awareness. And, and the problem here is we all think we're highly self-aware and the vast majority of us are not. There's recent research by Tasha Yurik that shows that 95% of us will self-report, oh yeah, I'm highly self-aware. And in fact, research shows it's about 10 to 15% of us. So that's a big problem. And you know, one of the things I talk a lot about with men is the emotion of anger. And 
anger is a huge problem because like, think of your romantic partner, right? If they get angry with you, really hard not to catch their anger and reciprocate or respond in anger. And, and so like, I remember when I was married and, and now I'm happily divorced, but towards the end of my marriage, my wife accused me, my ex-wife now accused me of being angry. And I, you know, I had to think about that. And I thought at first I was angry being accused of being angry. And then I had to kind of consider it. And I was like, okay, fair enough. I think there's some valid reasons that I'm angry. However, let me take responsibility for my own anger and let me work on that. That's my piece. And so I got to the point where, and this was kind of the start of me getting into anger management many years ago, but I got to the point where she could yell at me and I knew I had done nothing wrong. So she is yelling at me incorrectly, in my opinion, or uh, like getting angry at me for no reason. And I could sit there and stay calm and respond appropriately with about 60% of my attention. Yeah, I hear you, honey. I, I understand. I, I see that you're really upset about this. And with the other 40% of my attention, which I would split, it was in my own head coaching myself, dude, take a deep breath. You're good. You haven't done anything wrong. This is her issue. This is her anger. It's not about you. And then, I mean, there's different things you could do. Like I would repeat a mantra uh, from a Shin song, actually, that was, you can't wrestle a dove. And so I re would repeat that. In other words, you can't fight something that doesn't fight back. And the other thing I will do, and I, I remember doing this in court while my wife slash ex-wife was on the stand talking to the judge and lying to him, to his face. And I, I can't show anger in that situation because then I'm going to be the angry man and I'm going to get a not very good verdict, not very good ruling. So what I was doing in that case is I was just wishing loving kindness thoughts on her, which sounds something like this. And I'm just breathing deeply, just thinking, may you be happy, may you be healthy. And then I would throw a little dig in, like, may you learn to be honest. And I would just repeat that over and over and over. Now, I don't know if that does anything for her. Like, I don't know that it makes her happy or healthy or more honest. But I do know that what it does for me is it helps me to regulate my emotions. I can deepen my breathing. I can bring my heart rate down slowly. I can relax the muscle tension. So I can radically accept the fact that she is on the stand sworn to honesty and is lying. Wow. Wow. What is the source of our anger and is all anger created equally? Oh boy. Uh, how much time do you have? I, I, you told me you're, you got a soft stop at the top of the hour. So I, I mean, that's a, that's a really big couple of questions. So I mean, anger, all emotions are purposeful, except for maybe shame. I can't really find a great reason that we feel shame, but all angers are mess or all emotions are. Is shame a, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off. Is, is shame an emotion or is it a, is it a state of mind or a state of being? In the way that I guess you I, it's been understand said that it. shame is the master emotion because it can overpower anything else. And, and I like that definition of shame as the feeling that we are not worthy of connection. And it's a really hard one to identify. Like, I don't think I was able to identify it myself until I was over the age of 50, which is kind of interesting. And the only way I identified it was because I would get to that point in a disagreement with my fiance where I was like, I would have thoughts about, mm, I'm, I don't think I'm worthy of being in this relationship. Like maybe I'm better off not being in a relationship, which underneath that is I'm not worthy of connection. And this was the, this was the time that you were the fiance to the wife that is now your ex-wife. Well, this is no, actually this is after my divorce. So I'm okay. Engaged. Okay. So this is, Okay, so this is the the the, the new relationship. Okay, I'm, yes. I'm, okay. Um, I was Sorry, just gonna. Kind of, <laughs> um, so anger. No, I think. Um, I mean, I'm 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 really fascinated with. Okay, so anger. Um, so anger. The the message that anger is typically sending us is someone is crossing or violating a boundary of ours, or someone is treating us in a way that we don't want to be treated. Now, that's kind of the simple message. It can be broken down like there's ten universal anger triggers. For instance. <clears throat> being slowed or stopped is a universal anger trigger. Boundaries are a universal anger trigger. So if someone gets too close to your physical being, like think of someone being up in your grill, trigger for anger. If someone's apple tree is dropping apples on your side of the fence, I've seen that trigger anger. I, I've actually read about some guy shooting his neighbor because of that, which 
is a little bit nuts. But anyway, um, there are things like um, tribes or identity. So if someone threatens your tribe, that can trigger anger. Think of a gang, think of a political party. Um, there is personal insult is a universal anger trigger. Um, family, someone threatening your family, which is funny to me because I always think of back in elementary school, like, you know, you can't beat up my brother, but I can. You know, it's okay for me to beat up my family member, but if you beat up my family member, God help you. Um, and and that, that one actually gets interestingly confusing because what if it's a family member that's attacking someone in your family in some way? And that gets really muddied. Because, and it happens quite frequently, right? You get an abusive parent or, you know, an alcoholic husband or wife, like that happens quite a bit. Um, but anyways, I mean, so anger fascinates me because I think of anger on three spectrums. Um, and I, I remember it with the acronym DIF. What's the DIF? D-I-F. So it's duration, intensity, and frequency. So duration is when you get angry, how long does it last? And emotions are only supposed to last about three minutes, give or take. But we do a really good job of holding on to anger. And, you know, think of grudges, which we can hold on to for a lifetime. Not healthy or effective, but we do it. Um, so duration, how long does it last? Intensity is what we normally think of with anger. So intensity, think of a one to 10 scale with one being calm, five being angry, and 10 being incredible Hulk enraged, like out of your mind. And this is the one we normally think of when we look at anger. And it fascinates me because what I tell all my clients is, you have to get on top of your anger before you get to a five on that scale. Because my belief is once you get past a five, you essentially become anger. You, you become completely emotional and there's no more rational you left in your mind. And, and the, the problematic thing about anger is it feels really good to be angry. When I'm angry, I'm right. When I'm angry, it's all your fault. When I'm angry, I'm powerful. When I'm angry, I'm energized. When I'm angry, I haven't done anything wrong. And, and the problem with anger is that it really kills any sort of personal growth and learning. Because if you and I are in a knockdown, drag out argument, my thinking often is, man, if Frank would just stop being such a fill in the blank, I wouldn't be so angry. Mm. So I'm externalizing all blame onto you, which means I'm not taking any responsibility for what's going on. And that's a problem. Yeah, you become the victim and and and, and it and almost sounds like a victim and attacker is often what I see. Yeah, I mean this I mean it, it, and there's an element of 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 your ego, you know, rearing its ugly head here as well, right? It's like, you know, now it's this, you know, the anger at, at, at times I'm assuming can be a defense mechanism from protecting your your own self. Right. And that's where you're kind of wrestling here with this ego type of type of thing. Is it controlling me or is I just using it as a as a powerful tool? Where does rage come into play? Is rage the act of acting out your anger? Rage is I believe rage is where you become anger. And, and I've seen this in a lot of clients over the years where they will report something like, you know, I remember my wife saying something to me. It triggered me. And then I kind of woke up two minutes later and there was a hole in the wall. And they told me I did that, but I don't remember even doing that. But that's where you, you say stuff that maybe has a small grain of truth to it, but you blow it way out of proportion. You use always or never thinking, black or white, all or nothing thinking that, that you know, I can't say I'm always an idiot. That's just not true. I can't say I'm never an idiot. That's not true either. The truth is somewhere in the middle. And, and so it you completely lose that nuanced thinking. Um, and I would say you're more likely when you're enraged to go to physical violence, verbal violence, um, yeah, emotional abuse, those kind of things. You're gonna say stuff that you regret later or do stuff. Yeah, now when can, or is it possible for anger to serve us in a, in a positive or in a good way? Well, and so let me finish up that F part. So it's DIF, duration, intensity, frequency. So the frequency, just to finish up there, is how, how frequently are you getting angry? Is it once a day, once an hour, once a week, once a month? But realize if you're trying to get better and learn to manage your anger, improvement on any one of those three areas is still improvement. Um, so sorry, your question was... When can anger or is it possible useful. for anger to serve us 
uh, for positive or, or be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think absolutely. And I think it's more rare because I, I don't think most people have a great handle on their anger, so they don't know how to use it effectively. But you can use anger effectively in negotiation. Like we know from research studies that anger can be an effective tool in negotiations. But again, this is titrated anger or anger that is kept managed or even controlled. So you're not getting too angry. You're not getting past a five on that 10 point scale. I, I think the other way it can be used positively or proactively is in response to social injustice. You know, I, like I've had clients come in that are afraid, like D1 college football players that are, you know, linebackers and they have an anger issue and they're afraid that I'm going to take their anger away from them. And I have to reassure them, no, 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 that, that's not the goal here, nor is that even possible. What we're trying to do is teach you how to tap into your anger effectively when you're playing, but then manage the anger well when you're off the field. And, and so I, I think that, you know, for any kind of social injustice, anger is the fuel that leads us to protest, to speak up, to sign petitions, to go talk to our congressman um, or congresswoman. And, and I think that um, the other way that it works is as a signal or a messenger. So if it, it works really well to signal that someone is violating a boundary of ours or treating us in a way that we don't want to be treated. So when you get to the point of going, you have to be self-aware. You have to be train your mind to spend a little bit more time in the present moment, not in the past or the future, and tune your attention into your body rather than your head so that we can figure out, oh, huh, my heart rate's going up a little bit. Muscle tension's increasing. My jaw's getting tense. My brow's furrowed, you know, any one of those things. And then like, huh, I'm getting a little bit annoyed here. I wonder how come. Oh, you know, this guy on the freeway just got too close to me, or this guy just called me a moron, or um, this guy's showing up late for our meetings repeatedly. And, and then you can just speak up assertively to it and say, you know, hey, Bob, like, I really appreciate it if when we schedule a meeting, you show up on time. So you can speak to it firmly and assertively rather than getting aggressive or burying it. Got it. So the goal is never the elimination of the feeling or emotion of anger. The goal is to raise your level of self-awareness so that you understand your triggers. You understand how you can fall into this DIF, the, the duration, frequency, uh, in, in, in intensity. So, you know, bringing those down, working on those, but understanding like you're still going to have moments like you're a human being. Uh, anger is an emotion. We're all going to experience. It. It's a part of this life that we're all here on right now. So it's not about eliminating it. It's understanding your own. And I bring, I think it brings us back to self-awareness. And when you said, you know, 95% of people, I believe, claim to be self-aware, but in reality, it's somewhere between five to 10%. How much of that is maybe a lack of understanding of what actually self-awareness is? So what is self-awareness or what does it mean to be self-aware? Uh, great question. So self-awareness has two general aspects. One is being internally self-aware. The other is being externally self-aware. So internal self-awareness is an awareness of your emotions, your thoughts, your beliefs, your values, and your actions. So it's, it's pretty broad. And an external self-awareness is an awareness of how you impact other people. And that's the area that probably most people are completely oblivious to. I, I don't know, honestly. I, I think it varies. Most people are good at one of those, but not both of them. And if you don't have both of them, you can't say you're self-aware. And, and that's what the research shows that, you know, most people are good at either internal self-awareness or external self-awareness, but they, they fail to work on both. Where should people start if they want to begin to become more self-aware? To me, you got to start with internal self-awareness. Um, I suppose you can do both or I suppose you can do external. But to me, my bias is towards internal because I think that you have to know your own emotions before you can begin to pick them up in other people or have a more accurate understanding of what emotions you're fostering in others. This is amazing. Uh, so you got into men's work after like having a career. I mean, you're kind of in the second, maybe third career. We, we, we opened up talking about, you know, we opened up talking about the school, cool psychology. I know you had, uh, you had a, a practice of your own, a private practice. Um, so what, you know, what was that, that transition that got you from, you know, 
more, I don't know if it'd be just defined as clinical work, but, you know, more in tune with probably your path of education. Like most people don't go on and get a doctorate to then coach men, you know, online. Like they're, they're going to go, they're going to work in a school, they're going to work at a university, become a professor, or maybe open up a practice. So for you, what was it about that that maybe wasn't your well, calling so or where you felt comfortable? I, I like to joke at some level that the public school system cured me of my need to help children because it was so mucked up at the time and there were so many bizarre things happening like a special ed teacher coming to school drunk a resource teacher brought up on molestation charges and these were people that i worked with and like there wasn't anything that could be done about like the drunk teacher i'm like really anyway but there was you mean, you mean all teachers are aren't perfect angels and we should just yeah, trust well, them with our kids without I, I asking any questions and knowing who these I people are them to just be you know i don't know respectful or sober responsible um, yeah, yeah sober responsible. is a good sober is a good thing adults. if you got if you've got if you got kids that you're in charge so of sober is a good this, place to start yeah i had this realization like wow i could stay in this system for 30 years and never really implement the kind of change that i would like to see and so i left and then i started a entrepreneurial venture with a classmate of mine doing pre-employment testing over the internet for large companies that did really well for about seven years then the economy collapsed and then so did my company so I had to reinvent myself at that point, and I started getting into positive psychology, which is fascinating because I had the tools now for the negative side, the dark side of things. Positive psychology gave me the tool for the more positive, the lighter side of things. So <clears throat> after reading over a thousand studies in this, the, it basically positive psychology is the scientific study of happiness, but it's more specifically, it's, you know, understanding positive emotions, how to cultivate positive emotions, why you should give a shit about positive emotions. What do they do for us? It's about meaning and engagement. It's about how do you get in the zone or in the flow? Um, and all this stuff was just mind blowing to me. And I was like, oh my God, now I have tools to turn down the volume on the negative, turn up the volume on the positive. This is really powerful stuff. And so I started writing a book and compulsively wrote like 600 pages and then realized no one's going to read all this. But it was, it was a framework for how to coach people towards a successful and happy life. Because my experience had been that the success story that we're sold when we're younger doesn't care about or doesn't involve room for things like happiness, relaxation, contentment, curiosity, all the things that lead to happiness. It's just grind it out. It's just make more money. It's just get the next promotion. It's just be better than the next guy, all of which are kind of these man box socialization rules. But <clears throat> so I, I wrote this book, had a rough draft that led to me doing a radio show in the San Francisco Bay area for a year. And, you know, it was a daily primetime show with a large audience, it scared the crap out of me. I was <laughs> had to deal with my own anxiety there. Um, and was pretty bad at the beginning, but slowly kind of relaxed into it, got better at it, got to interview a number of world-class experts, and then stopped that after a year to publish part of the book and open up private practice. And so I started with positive psychology. That was kind of lukewarm. That led, uh, a friend of mine said, well, how about if you do anger management? And I was like, I can do that. Like I'll combine those two. And that led to working more with men than women. And Stopped that after about 10 years to work with more businessmen and executives and realized pretty quickly that the biggest source of their pain was actually at home with their spouse. And so I started getting into relationship skills to teach them how to be better in relationship. And that led to this more recent work in masculinity and man box culture. So that's kind of the process. Yeah, no, I definitely want to get, want to get into what you're what you're doing today. I do want to spend a little bit of time on on the happiness piece, though. You know, um, I think maybe this is one of those areas that maybe you and I, um, I don't want to say disagree, but maybe see it a little bit differently. So I'm curious for you. A number one, what is happiness, and why would why would happiness be a worthy pursuit or goal? Because uh, the short answer to that is success actually follows happiness. And I think the way that we're led to believe when we're younger is that happiness follows success. In other words, you know, the story I was fed when I was in high school was, you know, go to the, get the best grades you can, go to the best college you can, get the best job you can, get married, have kids, work your ass off until you're 65, retire, and then you'll be happy. And, and I can't tell you how many men I've talked to in their 50s that are worth a shit ton of money 
that are miserable. And they're like, John, I did it all right. I did everything I was supposed to. And they're tr it's true. They're good men, but they've never been taught the skills or tools on how to pursue happiness. And, and so, you know, happiness to me, um, I won't get real esoteric with this because I, there's a bunch of different answers here, but I like Martin Seligman's framework of PERMA and he's a professor at University of Pennsylvania, but PERMA is positive emotions. The E is for engagement or being in the zone more often. The R is for relationships. The M is for meaning and spirituality. And the A is for action or accomplishment. So we still have to do things in order to, to be happy. And, and I think there's other things you can argue that are in there or not in there, but there are ways to pursue each of those foundational pillars. And they're proven tools. And, and so that's kind of what I teach. Yeah, I think I, 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 I think I'm just hearing happiness and it's like, you know, the, the, the emotionness of, or the emotion of happy or feeling happy comes and goes and, you know, success is, you know, I like Earl Nightingale's, you know, definition of success, the, you know, the worthy pursuit of a meaningful goal or, or the continuals or damn, now I'm, now I'm, now I'm going to, uh, no, like anyways, well, you're working towards, you're working towards a worthy goal, but in the pursuit of a worthy goal, there's not always going to be happy moments. You're going to be happy. You're going to be sad. You're going to be anger all throughout the entire day. And I think that's why I'm asking, like, why do we, why do we make that the goal and not a state of joy? Uh, cause a state of joy is a, is a, is a state of being in my interpretation and understanding of it that will have happiness, that will have sadness, that will have grief, that will have anger, that will have other emotions that come into it. So I don't I, know I if maybe I mean, there, I'm we just, can, we can kind of drill down on this, but meaning purpose is a big part of a happy life because you're absolutely right. We're going to have ups and downs. I, I love the term vicissitudes, the vicissitudes of life, which is the ups and downs, right? You're going to have good days. You're going to have shitty days. And, and so part of this is also like, there's a great book by Todd Kajden and Robert Biswastiner called the upside of your, I think it's dark side or downside, but it's basically two positive psychologists writing about why the negative, mainly negative emotions are important and necessary and needed. And I think that the more that we can understand that every emotion has a purpose, the more that we can learn to radically accept all of our emotions without judgment. And that's a, that phrase in and of itself will take 20 years to figure out, but then you can ride, you can learn to surf the waves of emotion because you're right. It's not all about emotion and happiness itself is way too big and vague a term to be of any use scientifically. I just use that to communicate to people at first, but immediately I'll throw happiness out the door because it's not about happiness. It's about, I mean, part of this is about cultivating, learning to cultivate the, the circumstances in your life that will promote more frequent positive emotions. And, you know, one of the things you said, which I love is, you know, it's the purpose, it's the, I forget, the concerted pursuit of a meaningful goal, something about that Nightingale, right? So I agree. And, and, but here's the problem that I see with a lot of men, <clears throat> a lot of my clients will do that. And then we, we accomplish a small or huge goal. And we're so ill-trained that we can't even stop to savor and enjoy the accomplishment of that goal. We're just immediately on to the next thing. What's next? What's next? What's next? And that's a really lousy way to live life. It's unforgiving. It's merciless. And that's, I would argue, is part of the man box socialization too. You're only as good as your last achievement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with Ed Milet. I love the way that he kind of, you know, his, his word here or, or his, his, his way that he describes this is blissfully dissatisfied. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, it's like you, you, you think about, you know, you've, you like, you're, I'm a steak guy. Like I love a, a good piece of meat, you know, like, um, tomahawk ribeye whatever it is like you cut into that you know especially after like i love to go friday night that's kind of my thing I, I go out i have dinner with myself every friday night i got an old-fashioned i got a ribeye then i walk across the street and smoke a stogie um but that first bite it's like it satisfies you right it's like man it's just so good it's like i've been looking forward to this all week i'm, I'm happy that i'm having it but i'm i want to finish it like i'm blissfully like in the moment enjoying it but i'm dissatisfied because i'm i'm still hungry right so i'm going to continue eating eating the steak and 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 i'm glad we're we're 
we're, we're going here. I just think so many people, when they, when they hear the word happy, they're like, oh, it's this moment of, or this state of like, everything's going to be okay. And it's kind of like this utopia. And it's like, there's not going to be any challenge or difficulty. And you and I both know that real success is going to come with challenge. It's going to come with discomfort. It's going to come with delaying gratification. And happiness is the opposite, in my opinion, of a delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is pushing off the you're gonna yeah. you're gonna correct me here. So <laughs> the please pleasure, go ahead. Yeah. And and I think, you know, to me it's not about like to me the goal is not happiness. And and what we found is that pursuing happiness, contrary to what I was saying earlier, is not a good way to go. That we will kind of ensure our own misery by purposefully pursuing happiness. And and so as I said before, I, I think part of it is, you know, part of its meaning and purpose, part of its good relationships, solid relationships, supportive relationships, which is pretty rare. Um, but part of it is cultivating circumstances, like learning what the positive emotions are so that you can recognize them in the moment and savor them. And that also includes an understanding that not every moment is going to be filled with positive emotions because life is unfair. Life is painful. Life is struggle at times. But what I see is, you know, the, the typical person, the average person can only name three emotions in the moment in their body. And it's happy, sad, pissed off. So what I find with a lot of men is they, they don't even know when a positive emotion hits them in the face. And, and part of that, there's a reason for that. Like the, those negative emotions, the uncomfortable ones, they kind of yell at you. They make themselves known. They're loud. Whereas the positive emotions are quiet. They whisper. They're soft. They're subtle. They're fleeting. And so if we don't train ourselves to recognize these emotions and sit with them for a few seconds, we're going to miss them. And that's a shame. Yeah, it brings us all the way back to uh, like just, you know, <laughs> this game of life is about a continuous, you know, up level of, of your own self-awareness, constantly learning and, and knowing yourself better and better. Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's a reason why this conversation is is needed to have. And I think that's going to kind of kind of get us to, you know, probably where we'll kind of go here for, you know, for for the second half of this conversation, which is you've dropped, the, you know, the word here a couple of times or the phrase, this man box culture, how it's tied to masculinity, how it's, you know, so please, you know, kind of, you know, share with us, you know, what is the man box culture? How did you kind of, you know, stumble across it? Um, and then we'll kind of use that okay. as you know the, the launching point for the second so part. So this is an idea that came up in the 1980s via Paul Kivel, who was working in Oakland with teenage boys in high schools, and he couldn't get the boys he was working with to invest in their own education. I think probably because it was not seen as cool. It was not seen as masculine. And he got frustrated, and so he just started asking hundreds of young men, what does it mean to you to be a man? And there was a variety of answers, but they all followed some similar themes. And the themes are things like men dominate women, men don't back down, men are aggressive, men provide for the family, men are self-reliant. In other words, we don't ask for help. Uh, men avoid all things feminine. Men are not homosexual. Men are tough. Men excel at sports. And the big one to me, men do not feel. Men are stoic. And so here's where I've gone with that. So and, and this, amazingly, this starts at like the age of five. As soon as we start to get around groups of boys, it's been shown to start in kindergarten and perhaps preschool. And it's, I think it's softer then, you know, it's like, oh, Bob, don't be a girl. You know, it's like that kind of stuff. But then you go into middle school and high school and, you know, think back to your own experience and see if this was true. I've talked to thousands of men all over the world and this seems to ring true for 98% of them. But if you show too much sadness or fear, in public, in front of others, someone at some point is going to say something like, dude, stop being such a pussy. Don't be a little bitch or don't be a little girl. Now, there's other insults we can get, and I apologize for the language, but I think it's important to talk about this. And those three insults are the epitome of the feminine. They could not be more feminine. And so the, the message there is don't be feminine. And I don't think it takes many times of receiving those insults before we're like, shit, I'm, I'm not showing those again. That's painful. It's humiliating. That sucks. And so we jump back in the man box. On the other side of the emotional spectrum, if we show too much joy, love, romanticism, flamboyance, excitement, we get something like, dude, stop being so gay or don't be a fag. The message there, don't be homosexual. And so we jump back in the man box after we get that a couple of times. And so what are we left with that we can feel or even publicly display without fear of humiliation. And I would say it's roughly three things. 
it's lust. She's so hot, I'd do her. Look at that ass in those jeans. It's stress, because if I tell you, Frank, I am so stressed, it kind of implies I'm busy and important. And the big one, anger, some degree of anger, irritation, frustration, annoyance, rage, but anger is safe. Like you're not going to get called out for showing anger. In fact, most people are going to back down and you know show fear in response to your anger. And so anger is safe for us. Again, we externalize all blame. It energizes us, makes us feel powerful. And the problem is it cuts us off from learning and it cuts us off from relationship. And, and so, you know, this just fascinates me because I can, I can really relate this man box socialization process to almost everything going on in society right now. In fact, we found there was research that came out recently that showed that gender, because gender is different than sex, right? Sex is male to female and anything in between on the spectrum. Gender is masculinity to femininity and anywhere in between on the spectrum. So you could have a masculine female. I, my mother was a masculine female. She prided herself on that. And you can have a feminine male and anything in between. But what they found is that our political identification is best predicted by where we are on the gender spectrum, how masculine or how feminine we are. So Republicans, hyper-masculine typically. Democrats tend it more on the feminine side, regardless of sex. The men. Yeah. Oh. Regardless of sex, men and women. So you're, Republican women are, <laughs> are more masculine? Yeah. Well, think about it, right? I would argue that most Republican women are business women. Now, you could also be, um, there are some, the other part of masculinity is it's traditional. Right. So you can have Republican women that are with of traditional values, like the man should go to work, the woman should stay home. So they subscribe to traditional masculine norms. Yeah, but that would be a feminine woman. That wouldn't be a, a masculine woman that's subscribing to a, a, a traditional nuclear family. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, but I think it's um, this is percentages and averages. So there's got to be course. exceptions. Yeah, I mean. So sex is male and female. Gender is on the scale of the spectrum of masculinity and, 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 and femininity. Um, and I agree with that. And I, I, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's bi biological, you know, backing with that as well. Like, you, you, you know, as a psychologist, like uh, personality psychology, you know, you have the big five, like, you know, certain, certain personality traits are going to lead you more towards a masculine. Other ones are going to lead you more towards a feminine. So I'm in agreement with you that you can have a feminine. I think, I think it's on average one out of every 10 men has the, uh, the personality traits and characteristics of the average woman and one out of every 10 women has the average personality traits of, of a man. So I'm in agreement uh, with, with that, I guess I'm because of it's obviously, you know, in, in the world and it's, it's, it's a main, you know, discussion and topic point, hot political point as well. Are you saying that men, and this is where I knew how we were, we were going to get into this. So um, I, I, I apologize if we're, if, if I'm, if I'm going way off topic here, can men become women and can women become men? Like is gender something that is fluid as far as our changing of it? Or do you see it as like gender is masculine and feminine and then sex is men and, and women? Like there's a separation of the two because I think society is trying to tell us that there's not that separation. Yeah, and, and I, I don't have a clear answer to that. That's not my area of expertise. I've, I've worked with clients that are bi, pan, trans. Um, and you know my job I feel is to support them and, you know, especially with a trans individual, I want to make sure that they're safe. I want to make sure that they're not suicidal. Um, I know the road that they walk is very difficult. I tend to believe, and, and one of the things that's, I was working with a gay client years ago, and uh, the family's Middle Eastern, and the parents just could not accept the fact that he was gay. And we did some research, and we found that one of the main underlying differences between people that accept homosexuality and resist homosexuality is their belief of the extent to which homosexuality is innate or you're born with it genetically versus it's a choice. So if you think it's a choice, then you're going to be more resistant to homosexuality. If you think it's not a choice, you're going to be like, okay, well, do your thing. You're going to be more accepting. Personally, I don't know why we just can't accept everyone. Um, like I, 
because I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for ways that we are similar. I'm not looking for ways to be different. I'm not looking for ways to be special. I'm looking for where are we the same? And that's one of the reasons why I like this level of emotion, because no matter why you felt what you felt in the past, I felt something either exactly the same or remarkably similar. And so on that emotional level, I can find similarities with anyone on this planet. Uh, agreed. No, hundred, hundred percent. I'm right there, right in, right in line. I think we're, I think we agree, agree on that. So back to this, this, this man box culture, because we could, I, I could take this way down a rabbit hole that would no serve anybody on listening on the other side. It would be <laughs> selfishly for me to understand you, you deeper, but that's not important for the people listening here. The man box culture though. So, um, discovered in the eighties or founded, or, you know, the theory came up in, 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 in the eighties, it's identifying that, you know, these traits are squeezing themselves out of boys and we're really driving them to these, you know, these key three, not key three, but these three kind of main masculine traits. Um, why is that a, like, why is bringing out the masculine of young boys a bad thing? I, I don't, I don't see it as a bad thing. I, I don't see any of it as a bad thing. I, I think that because I, I've been accused in prior interviews of arguing for the wussification of men, right? And it's like, huh, okay. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but all right. And I, you know, my response was that that's not what I'm arguing for. I'm, I'm arguing for kind of this idea of full spectrum masculinity. And, and going back to the happiness conversation we had earlier, it's allowing yourself to feel whatever you feel without judgment. It's allowing whatever's arising to arise without judgment, because what do we do, right? Like we are human and therefore we feel. Man, woman, doesn't matter, anything in between. So what happens to men who subscribe strongly tra to traditional man box values when they get depressed, when they have a panic attack, when they feel anxious, when they feel scared? Typically what happens, because I know because I've worked with them, is they will shit on themselves. They will pile on and judge themselves for being depressed. For example, when I was younger and I got depressed, I was like, oh shit, I shouldn't feel this way. Like, I gotta stop being such a pussy. Like, man up. And then I would get angry at myself for feeling sad. And then, and you can keep going down that rabbit hole of shitting on yourself until you just feel worthless. And I would argue that's typically what happens with us. Whereas what I'm arguing for is to realize that you're human, above and beyond sex, and you're gonna feel emotions. That's just part of the human experience. And so, so it's really about the ability to shift gears, in my opinion. So, you know, I played sports until I was 50. And if, if you're playing sports, be like subscribe to the man box rules. That works for you, right? Be aggressive, be tough, ignore your pain, don't feel, don't back down compete. Like all that works, right? That's fine. But the problem I see is a lot of these men, like I deal with a lot of D1 athletes who are an 11 on a 10 point scale of competitiveness. And they can't differentiate that competing in a track and field event at University of Arizona is not the same thing as being in a disagreement with your wife. And so they're still going at this argument with their wife as if they're competing which is not a good way to go. It's not about winning and losing. And, and so and this you see playing out in the NFL, yeah. I'm sorry to, yeah, to yeah. cut you here, right? You see this playing out in the NFL with, you know, the, 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 the amount of videos that we've seen in the last handful of years of these athletes manhandling women. It's like, you just got to know better. So to me, I it's, mean, it's about shifting gears. So again, if you're playing rugby, go out and be traditionally masculine. Fine. That, that works. If you're on date night with your spouse or your girlfriend, assuming heterosexuality, you got to have a different set of tools and skills. You got to be communicative. You got to be empathetic. You got to be supportive. You got to be a good listener. You got to be emotionally aware. And we're not socialized to do any of those things. So one of the takeaways from this lesson for anyone listening is it's not your fault. In other words, you didn't ask to be socialized like this. It just happens. However, I would argue that it's our responsibility to develop these other skills. And then the last example is if you have a young daughter who falls and skins her knee, I would argue that takes a little bit different set of skills. You got to be patient, nurturing, caring, quiet. And, and so, you know, to me, most of the men I work with have the one set of skills to go play rugby with. They don't have the other sets to best meet the moment in those other yeah. examples. 
I love what you, this is going back to the beginning of what you were saying there though, when, you know, you talked about, you know, men that, you know, they let themselves down, they disappoint themselves and that self-talk begins to come in and then it rears a dug of head. And then it's like, you idiot, you loser, you're never going to get this. Da, 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 da. You know, I've, I've said this, you know, well, no hundreds, if not thousands of times now with the men that I work with, like the success in our program, in our recovery. And I believe a fundamental ingredient for success in anything in life is how you feel. And this is going to tie into success and happiness, right? How you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. Um, you know, if you spend some time literally just without a phone and just sit there in your thoughts and in your emotions, like things are going to come to the surface, but most of us aren't willing to do that because the minute something comes up that doesn't make us feel either happy or in a state that we're comfortable in, we run to a distraction, social media, cell phones, pornography with the men that I'm working with drugs, alcohol, competitive sports for maybe some of, some of your athletes, but it just comes back to how do you feel about yourself when, when you're by yourself, what are those reoccurring thoughts and self-talk. Yeah, and, and that, that brings up having. an interesting point because one of the things that I notice in every client I've worked with, and, and I think myself as well in the past, is a lot of this revolves around self-worth. And do you believe that you are worthy? Do you believe you're worthy of happiness, success, love, a good relationship, a good job? And I would say most of us, the answer is no. And, and so I'm often working with clients on how do we increase that self-worth because almost that's one of the first steps of you've got to believe you're deserving of those things. Yeah, it's all it's 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 all your I identity, right? The way that you your identity is the way that you see yourself in your own eyes. And, and one of the um, biggest barriers to this, I would argue, is your inner critic, our inner critic. And I, I talked to a lot of people about the inner critic, and man, that inner critic is freaking brutal. And I, I just briefly, like for those of you listening. Take stock of what your inner critic says to you. How are we, how are we for swearing on this podcast, Frank? Brother, we like this is this is uh, <laughs> let okay, it rip, okay. man. You, so, pornography, sex addiction, okay, drugs, cool. alcohol. So no, we've 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 had it all here. I've had Hall of Fame classic negative thoughts up until the age of I don't know 35, 40, was you fucking dumbass. Now, if I look at that and I ask myself, would I ever talk to anyone outside of my mind in that manner, the answer is hell no. All the stuff I've said to myself in my own head, I would never say to anyone else, but it's okay to say to myself, why is that? And so I think, you know, one of the things to play around with is this idea of self-compassion and cultivating an inner kind voice to speak to ourselves. And there's a lot of tremendous research on that in the last 15, 20 years. Yeah. We had talked about, um, I think this was after we had recorded the podcast for, for your episode. Um, and you had a word for it and it's, it's, it's now I've lost it off the top of my head here. Um, but it was gaining that awareness of your thoughts oh, or self critic and what it does. It opens up that metacognition. Yeah. So, um, talk at that a little bit, you know, how it kind of opens up that space, uh, where we can respond versus react. In yeah. Those so moments. let's, I mean, let's use anger as an example, right? So there's stimulus and there's response. Stimulus is, um, someone calls you an asshole. Response is you get angry, punch him in the face. Now you can separate the emotion from your action and you can separate the stimulus from the response in between both of those, there's a gap. And when we first become aware of this, the gap is a third of a second. And people are always telling me like, gee, that John, that's no time at all. Like, what can I do in a third of a second? Yes. And you're talking about the speed of thought. So in the beginning with awareness, you can go, dude, breathe or reinterpret it. Like, dude, he just had a bad day. That's how I talk to myself in my own head. I don't know, dude, I'm not sure why. Um, but, you know, so I, and I think with greater awareness and building this skill of metacognition, which is thinking about thinking or awareness of our thinking that we can expand that gap to a half a second, a second, five seconds. And that's where you start to realize some really big changes. And, you know, it's, it's the difference, like I, I describe it as kind of the thought stream, right? That stream of thoughts and emotions that kind of runs through your head all the time. And it's the difference between standing in the creek and being immersed in your thoughts and feelings versus stepping out onto the side of the creek and just watching the water and the leaves go by. And so it's, it's an incredibly important skill for happiness, for success, for leadership. Um, and it, there's some really easy ways to begin to play around with this. One of the ones that I like the most is this, th there was a study done on, they told people to stop, pause, and three times a day, simply ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? 
And the thing that I love about this is the answer doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if you come up with an answer. The important part about this is pausing and pulling back and reflecting on your thought stream and just going, huh, what is going on right now? And, and that begins to build the skill of meta awareness. The other, you know, I, I also try and give clients really simple frameworks to overlay on their mind to try and ask themselves, where's my mind trying to take me right now? And do I want to be there? And the, the framework is, you know, you're familiar with past, present, future, a really smart guy at Stanford just added positive and negative to that. So you got positive past, positive, present, positive, future, negative past, negative, present, negative, future. And if you look at, you know, where's my mind trying to take me right now, we know that our mind wanders more than half the time. And that wandering mind is associated with greater misery because normally it brings us to a negative past, which is the area of sadness, depression, guilt, shame, regret, or a negative future, which is the area of anxiety, stress, dread, and worry. And so if you can develop the skill, when you develop the skill of saying, oh shit, I'm in the negative future, do I wanna be there? No, well, let me just focus on my breath and I'll come back to a positive present and stay there for a minute. No, that's, 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 that's incredible. Um, and I know I told you this, man, like, um, I love, I don't know about, you man. I, I know you've, you've, you've had your podcast for, for a while. Like, you know, obviously it's incredible that we have, you know, an audience that listens to this thing, but at the end of the day, like these conversations have given me, uh, more value, more personal growth, more self-development. And it just, it's, it's incredible when I hear things like what you just said here with, you know, the, the, the studies and the research, cause I'm not, you know, I'm not a trained uh, scientist that's going to dive into some research studies. I've read them and, but I'm not gonna be able to pull out some of the things that, that, that you're going to be able to, but to hear you say that, that thinking about what you've been thinking about opens up that gap. That is a part of our program. And I didn't understand the science behind it. I just knew that it was going to be effective and successful. If at the end of the day, you thought about your thoughts, and you just spend some time on where are these thoughts coming from? Where are they trying to take me? How are they serving me? How are they holding me back? And it's it's been amazing to see the men that I've been working with for you know almost two years now have these breakthroughs. And now I have things to kind of point to. It's like, yeah, this is why, this is why. So maybe when they're resistant, now I can say, hey, well, this is a part of this program because there's some research supporting this. I didn't want to tell you, I think probably the dude inner dialogue yeah. for you is because you're a West Coast Cali guy, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. So, Dr. John, this has been incredible, man. I mean, we've we've hit on uh, so much that that I wanted to get into, from the anger to to the man box to getting clear on a couple things here. That you know, like I said, I I, I knew coming in there was going to be a couple things I wanted to you know really really push on. But I'm glad we kind of cleared up you know that that happiness piece. That's not really the goal. That's I think I heard you say it, like that you kind of wave that word out there because it's a buzzword for people. Then once you're into your world, you're like, ah, that's not really what we're working for here. We're going to work on the self-development and then in the path of you gaining that self-awareness, you know, to navigate this, you know, this ocean of emotions that we're all going to have on a, on a daily basis. So a um, couple simple, maybe, you know, short rapid fire here. You know, I know obviously you work with a lot of men. Um, I don't know if you're a big reader, but, you know. Top, top three books for guys that maybe want to explore more about this masculinity or the anger or even the man box culture? Oh, boy. Um, off the top of my head, I would say anything by Terry Real. He just came out with a book called Us. Um, he's got some other amazing books. He's probably the world, I would say the world's best relationship counselor, but he writes in a way that is understandable. Uh, I would say The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer is a great one for understanding that voice in the mind and kind of learning how to deal with it differently. Um, one of the books that I loved was Chatter by Ethan Cross, who's the world's leading expert on the inner critic and kind of that inner voice and like scientifically proven tools to sleep comfortably with that inner voice or, or become friends with it. Um, I, I got a whole stack of books over here. I'm just like, hmm, I don't know. Those are the ones that come to mind right now. No, that's three. That's no, that, I mean, that's more than three. We got the Terry real series, the relationship counselor, uh, the untethered soul, incredible book, and then chatter. No, no, right there. Um, John, what are you most, you know, second half of 2022 here right now? What are you kind of most excited about, whether it's in your business, uh, personal life podcast in general, just, you know, any, anything kind of up and coming for you? Um, I, you know, I, being on podcasts like this excite me because I, I'm not really doing this for the money. Uh, I'm actually doing this because I think men need a helping hand. And I don't think we understand ourselves as well as we think we do. And so I, I appreciate the chance to get the word out. Um, you know, my fiance and I are doing a couples retreat in Costa Rica in April of 2023. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I got to get back to writing 
the book on man box and, and how do we evolve beyond it? Absolutely, brother. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I want to acknowledge you as well. You know, obviously, um, you know, I'm very narrowed niche down in the men that I'm specifically serving and working with, you know, through our company, Rebuild Recovery. But this podcast is to highlight other men, highlight other coaches that are spreading this masculinity message, that are spreading this message to help men level up, to help men grade their self-awareness, help men, you know, ultimately become the men that they had the potential to be in the minute they were created to be. So, so I appreciate the work that you're doing. I appreciate you having me on, on your podcast. And I appreciate you coming on here today as well. Um, if people want to connect more with you, uh, where are you hanging out socially online and, and where can they learn more about your work? And, and uh, you can you're doing? find out more at guide to self.com or at the evolved caveman.com. And I think on Instagram, I'm the evolved caveman and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. Twitter's John Shin. J O H N S C H I N. I think I never got around to getting the evolved caveman for that one, but, uh, but yeah, I'm out there. Yeah, guys. And, uh, anybody that wants to explore, connect with him socially, connect with his, his, his podcast. Um, this episode is going to air. I know yours you're holding for, for the fall. So this is going to air probably before that one. So go check out the call, uh, the evolved caveman podcast, uh, guys, gives me an upcoming episode, uh, with yours truly and John on his show. Uh, last question. I'm going to attend every single episode here with, um, to you. What does it mean to live a superhuman life? I, to, a superhuman life to me means cultivating resiliency so that we can bounce higher and more quickly after life cuts us off at the knees, because that's a guarantee. I mean, life is going to go wrong. Things are going to go badly. People are going to disappoint us. And I, I think it means, you know, one of the things I like to think is that the process of life is really a process of loving other people, getting hurt and disappointed by them, closing off to love, and then as quickly as you can, opening back up to love and doing the whole process again. And, and what I don't want to see is men closing themselves, closing themselves off to love, connection, relationship, and never opening up again. Incredible. So, so, so well said the, uh, the setbacks are certain, um, how you, how you respond in, 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 in pull out yourself out of those is, is, is going to be, you know, predicated on, on your level of self-awareness and it's going to play a massive role in, in the success and happiness, um, and all the positive emotions that you go on to experience and feel in the world. John, brother, I appreciate you so much. Hey, thank thanks you. for having me on, Frank. Um, thank you for your time here today. Thank you for, for, for your expertise. Uh, guys, if you are out there and this is your first time checking in with us, we, we appreciate you so much. Uh, we've seen tremendous growth with this, this message and movement over these last handful of months, and it's all due to you listeners out there. So if you got value out of today's episode, you can support us in one or two ways. First of all, leave us a five-star rating and written review, whether it's on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, whatever, show, whatever platform you're consuming, just drop us a rating and review if you're getting value out of it. But most importantly, if there's somebody in your life, men in particular, that are maybe going through some of these masculinity crises. Maybe they're struggling with some of this man box culture that we're all raised up in, and maybe they're not able to process these anger emotions, um, and they need the help. They need John's work. So do us the favor, but do them the blessing of sharing this conversation with them today. But for Dr. John Schinnerer, Frank Rich of Superman Life, we love you guys, and we'll see you next week.